Good evening and welcome to Choices. Tonight we're looking at health. Traditionally, good health is something that most of us take for granted. Illness is seen as a misfortune, occasionally avoidable but not always so. Doctors are there to make us better when we get ill. But this evening we want to look critically at those assumptions and see whether they're still true if they ever were. What is health and is it more than just the absence of illness? How responsible are we for our own health? And whose responsibility are we when we get older and are less able to look after ourselves? Today, when we talk of health, it's usually exercise and whole food that spring to mind. What's that, do you? It's tofu. Tofu, what's that? Soybean curd. What is it? It's, uh, <laughs> it's soya bean curd, ma'am. Oh, right. Uh, well, well two, two tofus then, dear, please. <laughs> and a cup of tea, ma'am. Oh, yeah, not all. Two teas, dear, please. Fruit wash, lapsang, rose, hibble, chamomile. Uh, what, 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 what sort of tea do you fancy? <laughs> and then the, uh, the Rui Bosch or the Lapsang? <laughs> and up to you. Um, well, two Lapsangs then, dear, please. Uh, one milky, one well, not quite so milky. <laughs> Soy milk, goat's milk or cows? What sort of milk do you want, <laughs> well, oh, oh, cows. Well, one, one with cows, dear, please, and, uh, and one with goats. The goats over by the coat rack. Just milk as much as you need. <laughs> but is the whole food prescription fashion or fact? How much can we as individuals do to prevent illness and improve the quality of our lives? Well, with me tonight to look at the choices from the consumer's point of view, we have Ian Kennedy, Professor of Medical Law and Ethics at King's College London, David Hobman, Director of Age Concern, Digby Anderson, Director of the Social Affairs Unit, and Angela Phillips, co-editor of the Feminist Guide to Health, Our Bodies, Ourselves. We also have with us a large audience, some of whom are specialists with a particular point of view to put, and we hope that everybody here will contribute. Well, Ian, let's start with you and ask you, in fact, what do you think that whole food and exercise have got to do with health? Some, but not much. I mean, I think it's a bit of, if I dare say it, a middle-class toy, which marketing managers are pretty close to catching on to in a big way, but really it's only at the edges of any concern for what re health is really about. The sort of choices uh, you make about health food are the sort of choices you make if you've got the luxury to make choices. Yeah. Angela, what do you think? I think that it would be wrong to ignore the fact that eating properly is, ver a ver is a very important basis of good health. The problem is not whether one ought to eat properly, but whether one can. I'll have a go. Go on. I'll have a go at the notion of a healthy diet with the accent on the A. The notion that you can recommend a new diet to everybody indiscriminately is nonsense. Quite frankly, children and women, nursing women, elderly people, poor people, rich people have different needs and should be changing their diets in different ways, if at all. And the idea of fine, firing propaganda indiscriminately, suggesting that we all should be turning towards a diet, is dangerous nonsense. Right. Anybody who's actually prepared to say, well, actually, you know, this exercise in Whole Foods a real waste of time? Well, I don't think it's a waste of time, Julia, but, but for older people, <laughs> who, on, David. older people who live alone, it isn't the food they eat that's important, it's the people they don't eat it with. Yeah. Uh, I think of an elderly lady who said, to the Meals on Wheels organiser, don't bother to send it anymore, my dog died yesterday. A story of an elderly person who had an isolated life. And for her, anyway, the shop on the corner doesn't have the whole food, she can't afford it. Of course she can eat better, of course she can make some advance, but really the food is so incidental in the lives of older people to the whole range of relationships and eating a, 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 a banquet alone is a pretty miserable affair. Can I ask the audience generally, what do you think actually this health is that we're really trying to achieve? What's your definition of health? Or good health, perhaps, I ought to say. At the back there. I believe health to be uh, body, mind and spirit. And I think there's so much concentration these days on health of the body, uh, when we as a nation are, are, are spiritually dying. And over there. I was just going to give you the WHO definition of health, which is complete bodily, social and psychological well-being. That's a good starting point. I think, I think that's right. Ian Kennedy. Well, yes, I think that that is a good starting point. It's often attacked as being so woolly as to be unhelpful. Mm. Uh, but it's fair to say that it represents an aspiration more than an articulation of particular goals. 
And I have no doubt that we can talk about food, we can talk about what doctors can do, we can talk about miracle cures tomorrow, but if we haven't got an educated population such that we can all know what choices are available to us, we, haven't, we don't understand or haven't got the information, if we haven't got a well-housed community, if we haven't got a community which has a job or some other way of fulfilling itself, then we can, we can forget the rest. We'll never get anywhere near the aspirations of the WHO. So I think we're talking about, if it's a program about choices about health, we have to, as a society, come together and seek to put everybody in a position where they can make choices which will really be affecting their health. Digby Anderson. Well, I, uh, Ian Kennedy says that the WHO d d definition is regarded as woolly. It certainly is woolly. And I would have thought that, generally speaking, when we talk about health, we use the word in two different ways. First of all, to indicate all those sorts of woolly things about um, well-being. And secondly, in a much more restrictive way, to talk about certain sorts of services. And there is a danger in trying to lump everything under the um, banner of health. We've hardly been going a minute or so, and we're already talking about employment, wages, the political economy of the country, the state of our society and, and goods. I don't really know that you're actually going to help people very much by becoming so woolly so fast. Well, I don't think that's woolly with respect, is it, to talk about the economy of the nation or whether we've got housing. I mean, if you look at the evidence, Digby Anderson knows the evidence better than I, uh, it is the case that people born into a certain social class, if I may use that word, uh, it's become less fashionable, have a reduced life expectancy. Their children will be more likely to be ill, something you order of five times more likely, and so on and so forth. This is not to say that, uh, it, it's only to say that we ought, to, if we care about people, do something about it. Now, it's a function of what we care about. We can either care about ourselves, and the rest take uh, the hindmost, or, alternatively, we care about everybody, in which case we ought, to, as a society, to do something about that reality. It is a reality, Digby Anderson. The Digby and then Angela. The trouble is that doing something about a society is not at all as easy as no. doing something rather more specific. And we haven't had any examples of societies that have managed to do something about themselves in this way so as to solve their health problems. Well, Angela, I think there are quite a lot of societies who are oh. doing a lot better than, uh, than we are at we Finland, know. for a start. I think we also have to talk about empowering people. And I think people, even living in quite difficult circumstances, can be empowered by the desire to fight for themselves. And I think when we're talking about what is health, it's the ability to live your life to the full according to your own criteria. And I have certainly seen women working, living in quite difficult in, in, and impoverished circumstances who have transformed their health, not perhaps to the degree that they would have done if they had a middle-class background and all the privileges that go with it, but they've begun to make changes in their health when they've begun to get together, mm. when they've begun to join women's groups, when they've begun to discuss their health care, when they've begun to make compare notes and discuss, discuss ways in which they themselves can organise and fight. Penny Fenn Clark, what do you feel that health is about? I feel that we have missed at the moment the implications of health in terms of salvation, which is also another root of the word. And that if we see ourselves in our proper place in society, because each of us alone is very, very small, and yet each of us is individually extremely important. If we get this proportion right, and as a Christian I would see us getting it right in terms of being a redeemed sinner and a joyful sinner at that, if we can get this right, we will be healthy at a point which may transcend bad housing, poor education, um, and, and all the other things. Are you saying that, you know, religion or some kind of spirituality is essential for good health? I think it is, most definitely, but I think having said that, a lot of people don't know where they should go after they've said that. They know if they want to keep physically healthy, they should go jogging. If they want to educate their mind, they must listen to Radio 3. After that, <laughs> <laughs> what do they do next? They don't know where to turn. Well, what about having some of their possible illnesses prevented? I mean, what, what about, for instance, the whole area of preventive medicine? How useful can that be? Dr. John Robson, I mean, what, what do you feel? How much could we actually prevent of people being ill? I think it's extremely concerning that many of the people here are missing the main point, which is that Britain has the worst health record in the Western world at the present time, that more Britons, thousands and hundreds of thousands of Britons are dying of unnecessary diseases, heart disease and cancers, which about half uh, could be prevented with present medical knowledge. What can actually be done for people? Um, you can tell me what you've eaten, but you can't tell me what your blood pressure is unless it's measured, and so we need a vast number of resources down to the sort of level that 
Um, you were talking about what they've done in Finland, where they've poured in resources into primary care, into nurses, into general practitioners who can counsel on the front line um, a, on, on diet and so on. The problem is we've we're still got a, a, a system of care which is dealing with a queue outside the door, the, the demand. The problem is for these diseases, if you're in that queue, you're too late. I mean, we have to get to people well beyond then, and we need a big devolution of resources into, into, into primary care. D.B. Anderson, should we actually be going out and looking for people, and sort of saying, OK, we think you're at risk, we want to do something about it? We should be doing it if people wish it to be done, and they should be consulted about it. It certainly shouldn't be, a, it be imposed upon them. And we should be doing it only if we, by looking at other societies which have done it, have found that it works. It is, preventive medicine is no cure-all. Angela, what do you think of preventive medicine? Is it a cure-all? I think preventative and medicine are quite un uncomfortable two words to put together. I think you prevent illness mm. before you get as far as the medicine. I think medicine is actually there to cure disease. I think, prevent I think health is, a, is something that happens before you get as far as a doctor's surgery. And although I think screening services are very, are very useful, and I would like to see more resources put into primary care, care I, think it's, I think people tend to confuse screening with prevention. I don't think they're the same thing at all. So what's I think, prevention? I think, I think prevention is, I, and I'm sorry to go back to these things again, I think prevention is what we've already been talking about. Prevention is massive for housing programmes. Prevention is doing something about lead in pe petrol. Prevention, in to, for, take example, for example, cervical cancer, which is one of the things people discuss a lot in terms of screening. Prevention for cervical cancer goes back to doing things like advising all women to use a contraceptive diaphragm instead of using the pill or using nothing at all. It goes back even further than that. It goes back to getting mothers to explain to their young sons that they should be a bit cleaner and wash themselves regularly. That is prevention. That is going to prevent cervical cancer. Screening, doing screening programs for cervical cytology, may catch the disease at an early stage, but it's not preventing it. There's a complication, isn't there? Because a lot of people would say, OK, we ought to try and prevent people, stop people, educate people, for instance, not to smoke, not to drink. But then there's an argument that goes, well, if they do persist in smoking and drinking, which they know damn well to be bad for them, what do we actually do then? Should we actually be treating people who are, if you like, arguably inflicting their illnesses upon themselves? Digby Anderson. Well, I think you've put your finger on it because it is one thing to educate people in the sense of putting out pamphlets warning them about things um, and giving them educational advice. But if the health system gives them the contrary advice, which is whatever you do, having ignored all the advice, if you choose to inflict those things on, on yourselves, we will bail you out. We will pay for you. We will pay for your abortions. We will pay for your liver, which is rotten for drinking. We will pay for the damage you do for yourself smoking. That is the opposite message to the educational message. And in a ration system, and it is a ration system, that is to say we can't spend all we want on any form of health care, those things are taking up valuable resources. Those things are being allocated to some patients so that other patients are not getting treatment and not getting the advice they need. Ian, Ian Kennedy, do you agree with that? No. Um, <laughs> what a surprise. I think that it's a view which is a convenient view it's a view which is known in the trade as blaming the victim. It's very often the case that people who engage in certain kinds of behavior which is less fortunate in terms of their health later on are people who either have limited choices or alternatively have made choices which are ill-informed and now find themselves unable to avoid them. I think if we were to stand back and ask whether where we would stop do we not treat the rugby player or the footballer or the mountaineer or the fisherman and if Digby Anderson wants to pre present me with a list of, as it were, points, how many points you lose on the health service if you've gone fishing twice a week, uh, angling death rates very high, because uh, people get swept out to sea, and so on and so forth. Well, it's very difficult, and Digby Anderson is in one, one level of his conversation very much against social engineering, very much against telling people what they, what they ought to do. Another, on another hand, he's telling people, well, you can't do this, or if you do, you'll take these consequences, regardless of how you actually found yourself in that situation. Penny Fenn Clark, you actually work in a hospital. Would you feel that people who actually care for patients in a hospital do sometimes blame their patients for being victims? I think they do. And I have heard it voiced among some young professional people, some people in my own profession, that they feel a certain reluctance to treat people who have contributed to their own illness. 
which is, I feel, in a sense, judging the worthiness of that person to receive treatment. And as Ian was saying, at what point do you stop? At what point do you say, I will not treat this broken leg because he was a drunk motorcyclist. I will not treat this patient because he is an AIDS victim. Martin Weaver, you're from the Terence Higgins Trust. Do you think that people get blamed if they, for instance, got AIDS? Oh, yes, all the time. We have a great many calls from people um, who go into hospital just for a checkup, and they, the doctor then does some other tests, sits them down, and then says, well, you're OK on that, but you've got AIDS. And I think the thing that happens then is, because the doctor is so frightened and so scared, and he's human like, or she's human like anybody else, they have their own bigotries, they then send this person out onto the streets in the afternoon and with a cursory 30-minute talk and say, go and call the trust, they'll sort you out. I think if we're talking about health education, we shouldn't sit there with them and us. A lot of the doctors and nurses need to be educated as well. We find a lot of the problem is the word victim. And a lot of our work in the trust is telling people with AIDS, you have power over your own life. And doctors can say, it's your fault. We know that it isn't. Can I ask some people in the audience who haven't spoken yet, how sympathetic are you to people who are arguably, at least partially, to blame for whatever it is that they've, they, they've got? At the back there. I rather suspect that we're slightly out of focus in that we are looking at people who are, if you like, deliberately self-harming themselves and we're aiming, them to, we're aiming to rid them of the primary reason why they're harming themselves, to tell them to stop smoking or to stop drinking, but the problem that we should focus on is the reason that they're smoking or that they're drinking or the problem for which they're harming themselves. And when we aim at that as the thing that we should be curing, then we're on the right road to health. Right, right, right. Yes. Vivian Nathanson. One of the undoubted major factors in things like smoking is the effect of the opinions of society as reflected, for example, in the advertising media. And if people um, see smoking as an acceptable behaviour, as a, a macho behaviour, or related to a, an acceptable lifestyle, or they see alcohol as re related to an acceptable lifestyle because they associate that with the adverts, then it encourages them to use those particular drugs. And that's what we have to look at. That's one of the major problems in changing behavior. It's very well saying to people, smoking's bad for you. Mm. But if they associate smoking with sport, because they see it advertised at sport events, then they're not going to believe it. So who would one actually argue is, in fact, responsible for the individual's health? Digby Anderson. Well, in the end, the individual must be responsible for his health and or her health and must take fundamental responsibility for it. We've just heard a litany of all the things which have to do with health. There is no way that a government could be responsible for all those. In the end, it comes down to the individual. And what about if the individual can't cope? If the individual can't, genuinely can't cope, then there is perfectly good, good reason to help him. But there's no reason to help everybody indiscriminately um, when they do, when they should be encouraged in a society which has more information than ever before about such things to look after themselves. Can we give yeah. just a couple of examples where that thesis is untenable? Uh, one would be the reality of accidents. Accidents are an inevitability. To say that someone's responsible for their health when they drive down the motorway and suddenly a great truck comes through the central divide and mows them down is to stretch the notion of responsibility so far as to lose it any meaning whatsoever. And there are other examples one can think of, but I would put it to you, uh, Digby Anderson, I'm sure you recognise, that this responsibility goes so far, but it has to presuppose a society sufficiently well organised that certain things, I mean, you, for example, would vote even in your posture for a red light to stop the odd traffic uh, sure. lunatic going through the intersection yeah, without thinking about it. And under those circumstances, we then merely arguing about, about, amounts. Uh, about amounts and degrees. And you and I might well perhaps disagree, but I think we will both argue that there is some things which are open for society. And work accidents are another example. Th they are inevitable in our society. People do, while they're going glonk, glonk, glonk with the machine, get their hands knocked off. Now, we ought to think, certainly they're responsible, they try very hard, but nonetheless these things happen. In those circumstances, we, I think, as a group, ought to care about them. And we're talking about caring for others, that's all. Angela. I would, would, would tend to feel that, that responsibility, we, I mean, we have a joint responsibility for each other's health. I don't, think it, I don't think it's really possible to just put it back on the shoulders of the individual, because all individuals have different abilities to cope. And I think as soon as you start grading it and saying you're responsible for that and you're responsible for that, what you're, you end up by doing is punishing the powerless. 
because it is the most powerful amongst us who are most able to be healthy. It's the most powerful amongst us who are able to feel mentally healthy and able to be not get depressed by life and able to go out and feel on top of things all the while. It's the people who are least, least powerful, who are least able to make those choices. And I think we would just end up by just dumping on the powerless. And that, I think, would be quite the wrong way to look at health. Yes, in blue sort of that. Yeah, well, don't you think most of that <coughs> might be stupidity of the individual? Well, the, the individual is, in fact, being stupid in not knowing what's bad or good for him or her. No, is what I what mean saying? is they're basically lazy and they just don't bother instead of try. And I think that is quite unbelievably punitive attitude, and it's probably just because you're very young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but do you have any idea what... Them. Some are born with the response, sense of responsibility towards themselves and other people, and some are not. And it seems to me that we have, all of us, a collective responsibility to each other, a collective responsibility to society. That's why we've got a health service which, for all its failings, is the best in the world. And that is why we've got to support that, spend more money on primary health care for everybody. And I think to improve and support the health service, remembering what the choices are for those who have them, and that those people ought to reduce some of their choices and in, in order to support the whole. So is it a collective or individual responsibility, Jenny Pope? Well, I, I think that, that we've already heard enough to know that, the, that there are circumstances within, within which people don't have any choices. I mean, the, we live in a society now which has mass poverty, mass unemployment. People just haven't got enough money to feed themselves properly, to he heat themselves properly, to house themselves properly. And the sorts of things that we've been talking about are almost obscene in that, in that context, I think. But another dimension that I, I think we've mentioned, but in a sense almost skipped over, is that even those people who can make choices, who have the luxury of making choices, are, are, are acting within constraints, you know, and those constraints are imposed often by public policy. It's not that government is expected to do something. They're already doing things exactly. that damage our health. Exactly. They're already subsidizing transport policies which push the private car and road haulage rather than public transport. They're already, they alre we already have an energy policy which is Chernobyl dramatically illustrated. None of us have any choice. It doesn't even recognize national boundaries. So I think that, you know, yes, okay, individuals, some individuals do have some choices, but overwhelming that is this issue of public health, collective responsibility, and the Victorians certainly knew all about it, but in 1980s in Britain, we're, we're ignoramuses, really, I think. One of the things that most of us have no choice about is getting old unless we actually die prematurely. And uh, most of us <coughs> will, in fact, live to quite a ripe old age. Uh, and, in fact, whose responsibility then <coughs> is it? I mean, whose responsibility then is it to look after us, whether it's actually looking after us altogether or just looking after some aspects of our health? David Hobman. Well, most old people could manage very well if they had sufficient support income, decent place to live, very large numbers sadly need support from the community. And there are conditions in old age which one day hopefully will relieve uh, when we have better research and we invest more in it, but until we do, older people will suffer from very considerable disabilities, large numbers. We know that something in the region of one in five people over the age of 75 is going to suffer from dementia, and there are five of us on this panel. So one of us, <laughs> one of us may suffer from dementia. It's, the, it's a lottery. It's a lottery. It's nothing to do with how clever we are. It's nothing to do with what we eat. It's nothing to do with the kind of life we are. It's to do with factors which have still got to be discovered. And so somebody is going to have to turn to provide care for us. And I want to say one or two things, if I may. First of all, the resources we offer to older people in many cases are scandalous. And it isn't just to do with the government. It isn't just to do with the taxpayer. It's to do with attitudes towards ageing. The doctors who are more interested in heroic surgery than in working with chronic disability. The social workers who are very interested in crisis intervention with young families and children as long as it's between Monday and Friday. Not so interested in the difficulties which face older people. It's to do with attitudes. The doctor who says to the old patient, what else do you expect at your age? He wouldn't say, wouldn't say that to a young person. The nurse who says, or the attendant who says to the old person, we've been a naughty girl today, insulting human beings. So some of, the, some of the failures in the system are not to do with governments, they're to do with our attitudes towards ageing in other people. So who does look after us? 
in many cases, members of the family look after older people. And one of the things that makes me very angry are when politicians and archbishops and people who should know better lecture us about the virtues of Victorian society in a kind of nostalgic, sentimental view of a past that never was. Anybody who ended up in the poor law in the institutions wouldn't have thought Victorian society was so kind. I wish instead of haranguing us for not caring, what they do would be to praise those people, usually women, not always, sometimes men, often in middle age, late middle age, who are destroying their own future in order to care whilst we provide little or no care for the carers. We fail our responsibility. We are, after all, supposed to be members of the family of man. And I think it's to do with our fundamental values about life. I'm very sad that people assume that young life has some intrinsic value which old life doesn't have. Yeah. Is David Hobman right? <laughs> Is David Hobman right that we actually let it all fall through the gaps, that we don't actually praise the carers? Absolutely. I'm a, a GP, as you know, and I'm working in East London right on the, the, the front line of this poverty and inequality that we're, we're seeing. And all too often, one sees that um, carers often blackmailed into, into keeping their, their relatives at home for far longer because there isn't either the institutional provision of a hospital if people are that sick or the sort of family aids, home helps, day centres, bathing aids and all these very important people and it is shocking that when we have unemployment in my area at 30% people aren't being employed to do these kind of jobs where they're so urgently needed. Uh, Digby Anderson, do you think the carers are getting a rough deal? I think that this is one on which we can agree that the, it is much better um, that governments should provide help for people to help themselves than it is to, um, for them to extend their own influence into those, those fields. And any support that they can give is well merited there. I don't think, though, that that should necessarily apply to all people regardless of income. I don't think it should be a comprehensive thing which, in, which, which involves substantial financial support to people who have already got enough money. Um, that is just wasting resources which should be directed at the people that need it most. Michael Schluter, you've just started an organisation called Family Base. Do you think that in <coughs> fact the old people, the parents, are the responsibility of their families? I don't see who else can take responsibility for them. If you look at the number of people a social worker has to look after, there's say 40 people to one social worker. That means they may get half an hour or an hour a week at most. And I think we must realise that help is not always the same as love. And I think what old people value more than anything else is relationships with other people. That's a wonderful Perhaps. idea in relation to the extended family where it exists. But we've got two million elderly people in this country who live in single-person households. How do you think that the 74-year-old son of the 96-year-old mother is going to provide care for him? For goodness I, sake, we yes. have to do it within the community, by the community, and stop pretending that the extended family is just sitting, waiting to absorb all these people. They do wonderfully well when they can, under terrific strain, but it's an absolute I nonsense to pretend um, they're waiting. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not arguing that the state doesn't have a very important role to play. That is obviously clear to anybody who's dealt with old people, as you've eloquently stated. What I'm saying is that the extended family is an essential ingredient to provide love. Those without extended families are very much the poorer for it. Now, we have to understand the way that our economic system is constantly undermining the ability of the extended family to provide that care. We have the endless choices that we make for our mobility. We move from one job to another to another. We don't realize that as we get old, those choices boomerang back on ourselves and often leave people very isolated. They also break down the very communities that are meant to provide the help. Because if people are constantly moving, they're not in, they don't know their neighbors well enough to often provide the care. So I think if the community and the family are going to provide the care, it's essential we start thinking about providing a family base in a much more coherent sort of way. And that may limit our choices in other areas of our lives. Jackie Drake, you've just won a case in the European Court for invalid care allowance for married women, and particularly for yourself. Yes. Is, do you feel that the carers are getting a raw deal? I certainly do, yes. I don't think... I'm caring for my mother by choice. My mother was a carer herself, and she was a wonderful woman who I loved dearly. And I want to make her last years of her life as happy and as comfortable as I possibly can. But having made that choice to care for my mother, there's no backup service that goes with that. There's no emotional backup care. There's no practical backup care. There's no financial backup care. You have to go through eight people to get 
six mini pads to put on the bed, you know. And I think the money that's there is being wasted to have your toenails cut. You need to go to get three letters and return a letter, three type letters and three stamps to get your toenails cut. And before you can do that, you have to take all your pills and a sample of your eye. I think it's disgusting. <laughs> you know. Flo, what sort of backup do you think you ought to get? A lot more than what I do get, because I don't think I get enough. Because I'm a widow, and I get a widow's pension, I'm not allowed the invalid care allowance. Why not? I'm doing a job like other people. If I go out to work and I get a wage, then they won't say, you're a widow, so... Uh, you know, you can't have a wage this week. Why do you do it, though? Why do you well, actually stay at home and look it. after your mum? There's a, well, there's only me that can do it. Or the, or the others go out to work. They've got a full-time job. I gave my job up. I moved house to accommodate my mother. Jackie oh. Drake, do you reckon it's worth it? I think it's worth it. Um, you know, from my point of view, that's a personal choice. You know, anything is better than what is on offer at the moment. What but makes that, it worth it? Because my mother has been a wonderful mother to me. And I just can't say more than that. And the lapses of memory that she has, where her eyes fill up with tears and she grabs hold of my hand and says, I'll never forget you. Well, that's... When you've had a good night's sleep, it's worth it. When you've had two nights running without sleep, no. Well, some people it do it out of love. Some people do it out of duty. And some people do it because society makes them feel they ought to and they f make the wretched woman who had a rotten parent feel guilty for the rest of their life uh, because in some way they're not contributing to this older life. People have mixed motives, we ought to acknowledge that, but we really ought to provide a network through the community which helps to support those people and doesn't leave them feeling stranded and guilty when they can't cope or when there's no help or when in a sense they, they're actually unable to do it because they really can't face it. Well, That's feels, a human response too. I feel slightly irritated by this constant talk of the community and the extended family and other euphemisms for what we really mean, which is women. What we're actually talking about mm. is that women sure. will, will stay at home when sure. their babies are small because sure. it, for exactly the same arguments, they need our loving care 24 hours a day, all day, every day, seven days a week, day, week in, week out for the rest of their natural lives until they produce families of their own. And the same argument precisely is used when our parents get old. And it is not used for men. My brothers won't be expected to look after my mother. It will be me. And my mother and I will have to discuss this when the time comes, just as my mother had to look after her mother, and that wasn't perhaps the easiest thing that she ever had to do. Of course it's mainly a women's occupation. We understand that. But this kind of classic feminist argument that, it, that men are not involved in care, either of older people or younger people, it's just, I'm afraid, an absolute nonsense. But may I add just one word? I, I think it is, frankly, scandalous, isn't it, that we as a society sit back and allow people to slave away morning, noon, and night. O often women, but not exclusively women. I have two brothers. We shall have to... There are no... Uh, I have no sisters. We shall have to talk about my parents in due course. I hope they're not watching. And, <laughs> uh, it is scandalous that we do abandon a generation which didn't abandon us. After all, it was that generation that as it were, stood against the world a long time ago now. And I think in a program about choices, we're talking about choices of values ultimately, are we not? Uh, moral values and political values, and the moral values that are at stake are whether we care about ourselves and say that, uh, everybody look after him or herself, or whether we care about ourselves and others and find out whether we can look after the others. And one way of looking after them is to vote money in their direction. Another is to uh, adapt our attitudes so that we do care and show that care. And it's this renaissance of a caring, quote, society uh, which I'm looking for, but I see no evidence of it. I see uh, only uh, the growth of a no notion that we care only about ourselves and what we have and what we have we will keep and we certainly will not share it in the form of taxation with those who haven't been fortunate enough to acquire it. Digby Anderson, what kind of care do you think old people should have? Well, I'd like to take up something that, that, that has been missed, I think, in the discussion of old age. Um, we've rightly talked about people that don't have, that, who are poor and are in difficulty. But a lot of people in the society are now richer than they have ever been. And old age is one of the most predictable of situations to be in. It is a situation that many of us can start putting money aside for and preparing for in all sorts of ways. It is a situation in which a, a vast amount of personal responsibility can, can be invested precisely 
because it is so predictable, not for the, for, for the poor, not for some of the people we've been talking about, but for a very large number of people in the society. It is also a situation in which we've heard that however much it costs and it hurts, the family is indispensable for, the, for, for properly looking after old people. It just cannot be taken over by the state, however much that it might wish to do so. It is therefore incumbent on this society to make sure that the family as a structure does exist to look after us when we get to that age. And at the moment, I agree with what was said in the audience, we're doing our utmost to destroy the family. There's, there's another point about health. It's not just its quality, it's whether older people actually want the kind of services they're getting and the degree to which, as a society, we ought to be able to say, before it happens, before we're very vulnerable and very old and very frail, that we ought to be able to give informed choice to describe the kind of care we would like to have when we're too frail and old to command the circumstances. It seems to me it's not just about the place it happens, but the terms on which it's provided, which is very important. So, Angela, where do you think we should actually place our emphasis on health care? I think that a lot of what we've been talking about in this whole programme is, is, is going back to primary care and looking at the way we can w way of dealing with health care in the community. And a couple of women who were writing recently about it talked about the fact that there used to be a discussion of health care in the community and now we're talking about health care by the community and I think we have to step back a bit and talk about health care in the community and look at lots of different choices some some people would prefer sheltered accommodation some people want to be at home some people would love to look after their mothers but they would like to have a job as well and they'd like to have somebody come in the day to take their place there are so many different possibilities that need to be looked at I think what we must avoid is being rigid and we need to look after the people who are doing the caring as well as those who are being cared for. Ian, where should our general choices be in health care now? Well, I'm always tempted to say you want the five second or the ten second answer. My, my, view, the five second? my view is that the choices open to us are ultimately moral choices of whom we care for and whom we care about. And I say that until we start building society in which people have an opportunity to fulfill themselves generally, until we provide housing, education, and jobs, and a sense of fulfillment, spiritual as well, we can talk about health until we're blue in the face. We won't have begun to solve the problems it presents. Quite a stirring challenge from Ian Kennedy. It only remains for me, as we run out of time, to thank the panel and the audience to say that next week we're going to be talking about choices facing death. I hope you'll join me then. Till then, good night.